Let's look at that sentence that we've been looking at the past few videos. It will either rain or snow today, or else it won't. Now this sentence seems obvious. Imagine a meteorologist said it on uh, your local news. Is it obviously true? Well, let's check it out. We said that some stuff is implied in this sentence. And once we make all that stuff explicit, this sentence becomes something closer to either it will rain today or it will snow today, or it is not the case that it will rain today or it will snow today. Of course, what we're interested in is the proposition, the claim that's being made by this sentence, not the sentence itself. And if you don't remember the difference between those two things, go ahead and check out section one of this course. But this sentence, when it's all spelled out, seems to illuminate something about that proposition that's being made in a way that the first sentence didn't. It seems like the proposition we're interested in is made up of different little parts. In fact, some of these smaller parts are smaller propositions. For example, it will rain or snow today seems to be a proposition of its own. You could make that as a claim about reality. Of course, you put it together with a bunch of other stuff and you get our new claim, but that's at least a part of it. We have a proposition as a part of our fuller proposition. We call that a compound proposition. Now looking at that component proposition that we just said, it looks like it is also made up of other propositions. So for example, it will rain today. So it is a compound proposition made up of component propositions. That further component though, it will rain today. It doesn't seem like there are any other propositions that are hiding in there anywhere. So this is what we said was a basic proposition. A basic proposition is one that doesn't have other propositions as their components, as their parts. Now, remember we said that doesn't mean it doesn't have any parts. It just doesn't have other propositions as parts. So we have our compound propositions. They're made up of component propositions. Ultimately, we could get down to the smallest propositions, propositions that aren't made up of any other propositions, basic propositions. For right now, we'll look at that as our smallest level, as our basic building blocks. Of course, those along with connectives, which we'll get to in the next video. Now, notice how that one basic proposition, it will rain today, actually shows up in two places. It shows up in the first half and the second half of this compound proposition. It would be nice to have some kind of symbolization that we could use that would make it easier to pick out that fact that that basic proposition shows up in two places. Another reason that would be nice is because it would make the structure of the proposition a little more clear. We wouldn't have a bunch of words befuddling us. We would have nice and neat symbolization. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll symbolize it will rain today by an R and it will snow today by an S. So now we have either R or S or not either R or S. See how that's a lot cleaner? In this course, we're gonna symbolize basic propositions using what we'll call sentence letters. In other courses, they're called propositional constants or propositional parameters. And we're gonna do so using the capital letters of the modern English alphabet. It's important you don't use lowercase letters because we'll use those for other things later on. Now, of course, you may think, but there are only 26 letters in the English language and there are a whole lot of propositions. Why would we only limit ourselves to those 26? Well, no problem. If we ever get above 26 propositions that we're trying to symbolize, we'll just put subscripts, A sub one, A sub two, and of course there are an infinite number of subscripts, so we can have an infinite number of propositions. Here are some examples, by the way, from our book. We can symbolize antelopes chew the cud with an A, your best friend is my worst enemy with an F, Albany is the capital of New York with an N. One great thing about this setup is now we can have an isomorphic relationship between the propositions and the sentence letters that are symbolizing them. Remember, a sentence expresses a proposition, right? You use those physical words to express a claim about reality, but different sentences can express the same claim and the same sentence can be used to express different claims. So for example, this cat is, on, I'm sorry, my kids were watching uh, Aristocats. This cat is on the level, right? That made me think of a physical cat on like at a construction site, you know, on a level or uh, in the jazz community, right? It means like this person is, uh, is speaking the truth, something like that. So that same physical sentence can express two different claims about the world. Well, with our sentence letters, we're gonna make sure that we assign one sentence letter per proposition and one proposition per sentence letter. Now imagine that sentence that we've been looking at, it will rain today. 
what proposition, what claim about reality is being expressed? Well, it all depends on what day you're saying that. So let's say today, I think is April 26, 2019. Let's say if I say that today, I mean it will rain on April 26, 2019. That's the claim I'm making about reality. If I say it tomorrow instead, I'm claiming that April 27th, 2019, it will rain. In an argument, in a logical argument that can make things confusing. However, with our sentence letters, we can make sure that we are symbolizing one claim with one sentence letter and only that one sentence letter. So I can use an S to symbolize that claim that it's raining, it's gonna rain April 26, 2019. And then I'll know that I'm talking about a different claim about April 27th because I'll have a different sentence letter for that. Of course, as you can imagine, in everyday English, this would be a horrific setup, right? We wouldn't want a brand new sentence every time we wanted to say that it was going to rain on the day we're speaking, right? That's why the word today is such a nice word. It all depends on what day you're using it, and then we don't have to, you know, make any reference to the date. But in logical argument, when we're trying to be precise, now all of a sudden it becomes very important that we don't be vague on what day we're speaking about. So now we have R's and S's and A's and F's and N's. We said that we could even have uh, subscripts for some of these. So, you know, I could do this. I could say S sub one is it will rain April 26, 2019. F sub two, April 27, 2019. Right? I could keep going on like that and have all the days that are possible. But of course that would be very confusing. It would start to get jumbled up which one symbolizes what. So one really nice thing to do is to set out a glossary, to write down kind of like we've been writing before, our sentence letter, a colon, and a sentence that best expresses that proposition that we're trying to convey. A very uh, non-context sensitive kind of sentence, right? One that doesn't rely on a whole lot of todays and stuff like that. And you may be able to tell as, as some of our examples here, a good idea is to pick out like the most prominent word in that sentence and like pick the first letter or something like that. So for example, Albany's the capital of New York, they, uh, uh, Smith picked out the N from New York. Of course, like we said, there are a potentially insane amount of propositions that you could make. And just having like S mean forever and for all time, the claim that it will rain on April 26, 2019, uh, it doesn't seem very helpful, right? It seems like eventually we won't care about that proposition. So here's what we'll do. We'll have that sentence letter represent that specific proposition only for a particular amount of time while we're working with a specific glossary. And then when we're no longer using that glossary, when we don't need to use that glossary anymore, we could just forget about that assignment and reassign letters. It doesn't really matter as long as we are clear about which glossary we're using about, as long as there's no confusion about what the sentence letter is representing. Now, one last thing to note, and this is uh, something that Smith notes in the book, is that we said that we would use these sentence letters for basic propositions, to symbolize basic propositions. It's okay, however, to use these sentence letters to symbolize compound propositions so long as we can treat them as basic propositions, so long as it doesn't matter, right? Their structure doesn't matter. So here's an example. Let's say Andy and Boston and Charlie are hanging out and you wanna know if Charlie got off his butt and went to the store like you told him. You ask, who went to the store? You get the proposition, Andy and Boston went to the store and Charlie stayed home. Now from this, you can conclude that Charlie stayed home. Now technically speaking, this is something like A and B and C, therefore C, where A is Andy went to the store, B is Boston went to the store, and C is Charlie stayed home. However, we don't really need the A and the B to be separate. We could have A just stand for Andy and Boston went to the store. And then C stands for Charlie stayed home. And we have A and C, therefore C. That's all we really need. The important thing here is that combining A and B doesn't really affect the argument. Now, if it did, then we wouldn't want to do so. So for example, now let's say I wanted to know whether or not Boston went to the store. I get the proposition Andy and Boston went to the store and Charlie stayed home. Now I can't say A is Andy and Boston went to the store, C is Charlie stayed home, so I have A and C, therefore A, right? A was Andy and Boston went to the store. So what I'll have to do, I'll have to split those up into Andy went to the store and Boston went to the store and Charlie went to the store, or Charlie stayed home, therefore, Boston went to the store. So A and B and C, therefore B. The example Smith gives in the book is using that C to now stand for antelopes do not chew the cut. Now notice he has that not in there. That's one of our connectives. 
It's not the case that antelopes chew the cud. So we had C, really this should be not C. However, as long as it doesn't affect the argument, it's okay to have that C stand for the whole thing. Antelopes do not chew the cud. So for example, if you had something like antelopes do not chew the cud and Fred is tall, therefore antelopes do not chew the cud, you could symbolize that as something like not C and F, therefore not C. Or you could just have C stand for antelopes do not chew the cud and then have C and F, therefore C. So those are sentence letters. That's why we're using them. We're using them to symbolize basic propositions and compound propositions when it's convenient. We want to be very clear about what sentence letter is expressing what basic proposition, and we can do so using glossaries. But basic propositions weren't the only components of compound propositions. Remember, we also have connectives. So for next time, please read section 2.3.1, 2.3.2, and do 2.3.3.